Welcome back to Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. I'm personal financial planner, columnist, and financial therapist, Rick Kaler. Research tells us that 90% of all financial decisions are made emotionally, not logically. For nearly four decades, I've been helping people make better money decisions. So what makes my financial worldview different from most financial experts? I blend the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Good money decisions are not just about the money. So let's get started with today's episode. Welcome back to another edition. I want to explore the emotions behind why we make some really bad financial decisions and the emotions behind that. (laughs) Well, we've spent, what, 100 and... 40 podcasts talking about that in some form or fashion. But what I want to explore, and we've touched on this in the, in the past in episodes, but is uh, it's what's behind um, listening to others, listening to, to experts, list, listening to predictions. Let me give you an example. And this is going to get a little heady, but hang with me. It is financial therapy, and we're on the financial part right now. At the uh, height of the pandemic recession, it was uh, June 22nd, 2020, and there was a headline in thecapitalist.com, which caught my eye. And I often uh, put these types of things aside for future comment. And the headline was, dollar will plunge 35% lose status as world reserve currency. Now, if that doesn't alarm you, it uh, may be because this this isn't your world, Uh, economics and financial things. But let me, let me. Reframe what that would mean is if the dollar lost 35%, your purchasing power of foreign goods would uh, go up to where those, those goods would cost one third more than what they do right now. Think of that as 35% inflation in in one hit. That would grab our attention. And it would uh, cause a lot of chaos. And the dollar losing its place as the world reserve currency would result in more volatility in the dollar, less stability in our economy. So the the first paragraph of this article is that the U.S. dollar was on verge of a 35% collapse and it would lose its status as the world's currency, much like the headline. Now, this was a quote from uh, Stephen Roach. He's a senior fellow at Yale University and the former chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia. He made uh, similar statements in June of 2020. He did an interview you can find on marketwatch.com a day later than this one where he warned that the uh, U.S. dollar decline would happen at warp speed and sooner rather than later. Okay. So this was pretty alarming. It's especially alarming if we go back to his credentials. He had a tenure at Yale, which is no slouch university. He was ex-president of Morgan Stanley Asia. (laughs) Not a, 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 you know, a small uh, responsibility or feat. So he was just not a slouch when it came to credentials and credibility. 
And because of that, and with these are dire warnings, it's going to plunge 35% sooner rather than later. These comments alarmed a lot of uh, individuals who acted in fear and bailed out of their dollar-denominated investments. Now, I could go into a lot of mind-numbing investment details of what that meant, but it could have been something as simple as, oh, I have my savings account all in dollars. I'm going to get rid of it and put it all in euros or put it all in British pounds. And these are things that can be done relatively easy. It could have meant I'm going to sell out all of my U.S. stocks and invest only in international stocks. It could have also meant uh, some more risky strategies where I'm going to buy an option or sell puts or take a futures contract on the dollar falling which is a highly, highly, highly leveraged position, like 99%, where you can lose a fortune almost overnight or make a fortune almost overnight. So there's people that acted on this. Well, as it turned out, Roach was wrong. I mean, he was really wrong. So what happened? Well, when he made those dire warnings, a euro was worth a dollar thirteen. Now again, a thirty-five percent fall in the value of the U.S. dollar would have seen that euro <clears throat> going from a dollar thirteen to a dollar fifty-three. So just think about if you decided to go to any European country and there had been a thirty-five percent fall in the dollar your vacation would have gone up 35%. The cost of your rooms, food, transportation, that's pretty significantly, pretty significant. As well as we already talked about imports would cost much, much more. So what happened? Well, exactly three years after that prediction, the euro that was worth $1.13 was now $1.10. So Instead of the dollar losing 35%, it actually bought more, 2.65% more, three years later. Oops. <laughs> uh, and this, the, it was similar with the British pound. Um, the UK is a place that I love to visit. And when he made that prediction, <clears throat> the uh, pound was worth $1.25. Three years later, it was worth $1.28. Now, what that meant was the dollar lost purchasing power of 2.3%. So if you went to Britain today, things cost 2% more. Um, a big miss on the 35%. So, like I said, anybody that took positions acted out of fear on these predictions um, ended up at best with a nothing burger and at worst with significant losses because the dollar basically didn't go anywhere over that three year period of time. So what is going on there? And I, and I do want to, maybe I should say this first that to Roach's credit, he did something that's very unusual, very unusual for people who make predictions, most of which are bad. <laughs> he acknowledged his massive miss two years later on June 27, 2022, uh, in uh, 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 projectsyndicate.com. And he wrote, I should have listened to Alan Greenspan and asked, how did I get it so wrong? 
uh, which reminds me once I wrote a column. It was when Bill Clinton was president. And I wrote a column on the uh, ADA, American with Disabilities Act. And in it, I said, failure to comply with making your property accessible uh, could um, cause a fine. I think the fine was $50,000 in one year in jail. Well, I was uh, contacted by actually the uh, head of the ADA who said um, very kindly, dude, you got it wrong. And indeed, I had mixed up the FHA um, disabilities, not, not conforming with their regulations, which did carry a one-year jails up to one year jail term and a large penalty with the ADA. I was wrong. <clears throat> well, <laughs> I don't know. I, di I didn't have to think too much about it. I uh, wrote a follow-up column and corrected my mistake. Well, within a, a week or two, I started getting all sorts of letters um, thanking me for making that correction from all over the country. One of those letters was from President Bill Clinton. And I, I, I have it hanging in my office. I forget right now the specific words, but he basically said, I just wanted to reach out and thank you for correcting that. It's so unusual I ever hear of a journalist, maybe I was really a columnist, correcting or, or admitting when they are wrong. Wow. <laughs> I guess that's the only letter I've ever gotten from a president. So um, I, it is unusual, right? So. I, I just wanted to, to make that to his credit, that he um, had the courage to say I was wrong. So in uh, July, I, I read an article by Paul Krugman. He's a, an economist, writes for the New York Times. And if you want to read it, the title was Wonking Out, De-Dollarization Debunked. And he went into all sorts of reasons why um, the dollar's not going to fall out of uh, its reserve status for some time and really explains why and adds uh, a lot of data to that. And one, one that I thought was really interesting, and again, I'm wonking out on the financial side, is that a, it's important for a um, a um, currency, a reserve currency, or have it super helpful, I'll put it that way, if it goes along with a language that is the second language of, of uh, most people. And English is a second language of, whew, wow, billions of people. And if you wanted to compare that with the Chinese yuan, uh, how, how many places is Chinese a second language? Um, outside of China, very, very, very few. So, okay, so, so let's, let's get on to the uh, emotional side of this. Uh, because again, the moral of the story is that even for experts, it's really hard, really hard to predict a future trend of any market, whether it's interest rates, currency, stocks. And this is something that I am asked all the time. Well, um, what did somebody ask me just this week? They said it was something like throwing aside the fact that mm -hmm. You wouldn't do anything in the markets. What would you do right now? 
Um, so making prognostications can be fun. Um, they are n never anything to be taken seriously, especially by yourself. So what is under this? Well, anytime that we hear a prediction that evokes fear, uh, and we're talking about a uh, financial prediction, it's usually hitting a very vulnerable part of us, uh, an exile in IFS speak. And there is the fear of missing out or the fear of staying in. So that's FOMO, fear of missing out, or FOSSI, fear of staying in. FOSSI is something I made up. <laughs> so, I, I was like, what's the opposite of fear of missing out what would be the, the, which would motivate me to get in to something, buy into a market versus the fear of staying in, which would cause me to sell. And we've talked about this on the podcast a lot. And in this case, the, um, the fear, I, and I think uh, something we've never talked about it is that there's a vulnerable part of us or a, a manager that could have a money script that I am not smart enough. Um, I need to listen to people smarter than I am because they know. Now, there's some real sense to this, right? I mean, if I go to an attorney, I go to a medical doctor, I go to an accountant, and I go to them for that specific advice. The reasonable assumption is that they know more than I do. And that's not always the case. I remember the day that I, it hit me, wow, not all attorneys are experts. And in fact, in some cases, I know more than some attorneys. Uh, this was really brought home to me once when an attorney asked me if I would write the contract for deed for uh, a client buying a property. I was gobsmacked. I mean, at that time, I'm a real estate agent. I'm not an attorney. I don't write contracts for deeds. And he said, well, you probably know more about how to write a contract for deed than I do. Wow. And the same, of course, with medical doctors. Uh, I think that we have seen the great divide in applying knowledge uh, between uh, medical uh, professionals um, having come through the, the pandemic. So, I mean, this is just true in everything, in accountants. You, you cannot blindly assume that a professional knows. And this goes down, down to a really deep uh, wounding of often uh, there can be a desire for someone else to take care of me. Um, just a fear of being on our own, being alone, so to speak, in our decisions, needing the support, really relying on the support and advice of others. And for those of you inter are not interested, but uh, that know a little bit about the Enneagram, this would be very much uh, in the makeup or in the, the personality of a um, type six, uh, who's called the loyalist, that very much uh, looks for this type of, of support. Um, 
Now, that doesn't mean no, no other personality type has that. Um, they do. And so that can be a really a deep, deep driver of just a fear that there is no one to rely on. I must rely on people that know more than I myself. But that is too, that is to the, uh, to ignoring the, um, the signals from within that maybe they don't know. Um, so at the, the bottom of this is still taking a prediction, taking somebody else who is just so uh, triggered and urgent and the, themselves scared, right? And then doing your own research, especially before making an investment decision. And, you know, we have confirmation bias that we've talked about where when it comes to investments, uh, oftentimes we want to reach out to someone to confirm what we think we should do or to confirm what we're absolutely sure of. And when we hear something like this that brings up those fearful exiles, I mean, one thing to do is to do work on the exiles to really understand where their fear is coming from um, and, and to do that really deep work. Another thing for a manager to do that wants to jump on board with this prediction to, uh, uh, to soothe that scared part of us, that scared, vulnerable part of us, is to see if that part of us, that manager, would be open to some additional information or to some opposing information. And it's really quite wise to search out someone who has a directly opposite opinion and then listening to them. And I am sure, I, ha I didn't look, but I'm sure in June of 2020, there were other as notable economists who would be saying, um, no, I, I, I see nothing on the horizon that would suggest that. Or you can also find somebody that would say, oh man, no, he's way off. Actually, what's going to happen is the dollar's going to go up 35%. Well, it still doesn't hurt being aware of those conflicting opinions. And then put the, the screen on it of what is good for you, what is reasonable. Um, you know, if you have a financial planner, of course, talking to them. I don't know that it does a lot of good to talk to peers because we know that I think it's like 80% of all 401k decisions are made by people talking to a coworker who's deemed the smart one <laughs> of the company. So uh, we got we have to be careful where we get our information, but we really have to check in with those deep parts of us and, and get past the, the, the fear of that manager. See if it will just step aside and let us go to, um, and it, it, it may not be the fear of the manager, but just the actions of the manager. Yeah, we're gonna sell out of anything that has to do with the dollar. Why? Because we're scared, why? And start having a conversation with that part as to why am I scared? Well, I am afraid my lifestyle is going to decrease, okay? What is your fear if that decreases? Well, um, that I won't be able to eat, okay? 
uh, has that ever happened any time in your past where something uh, changed and you you weren't able to eat? Sometimes this can lead us back to a time in our childhood that there was a, a, a financial uh, upheaval and it resulted in mom and dad losing their jobs and having to scrounge for food, of not having enough to eat. Okay, well that then needs to be dealt with because that's business that was never finished. Obvi that would be called an ex extreme belief that if there's a hiccup in the dollar or the economy, because 35% fall is dire, but it's not the end of the world. Um, and helping that part to understand that that doesn't mean I would lose everything. I'd be out on the street with no shelter, no transportation, and no food. And to be with that part of us that was terrified when that happened. And therefore, when they hear the words loss or drop, they uh, just completely get triggered and freaked out. And these managers go into action, trying their very best to soothe that part of us. So I hope that's somewhat helpful in uh, when you hear these dire predictions Take a deep breath and get curious about what's coming up within you. Because when it comes to our money, it's important that we don't rely blindly on predictions of others, no matter how respected they may be. And it's important for us not to make decisions in a panic. Wait until uh, there's a little more calm and we can do that by going to those parts of ourselves and just being with them, just listening to their story. Um, and that when we're calmer, which would be uh, more self-energy and IFS speak, the more objective we are and we can focus on the long term rather than the short term and uh, help remind those parts of us that even the most knowledgeable experts when it comes to finance don't own crystal balls. So thanks for joining me. Look forward to being with you next week. Thanks for joining me, Rick Kaler, for another episode of Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. This is where I combine the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Remember, every financial behavior, whether it appears illogical to you or others, makes perfect sense when we understand the underlying beliefs, feelings, and thoughts. Sign up for my weekly blog at financialawakenings.com. I hope you'll join me again for our next episode.